All right, everybody, here we are again. We are back with the podcast. The podcast is Tanner Talks About Stuff That Happened. I'm Tanner, and I'm going to talk about stuff that happened. The stuff that happened that we're talking about today is going to be pretty mind-bending. If I'm being totally honest about that, it's we're going to go to some places that maybe you haven't thought to explore uh, I'm going to challenge some understandings that we have about human history at the moment, and it's going to be fun. It is going to be very fun. I've had so much fun uh, researching for this particular podcast episode, so I can't wait to go down this rabbit hole with you guys. Uh, I mean, I've already gone down it, but I can't wait to drag you all down with me because it's just going to be so much fun. So, today we're talking about megalithic mysteries and what a what a megalith is it is a something that is prehistoric um and it's large like like a large monument anything that is prehistoric man-made and a large monument fits into the category fits into the category of a megalith so we're talking about megalithic mysteries a series of of uh monuments locations, structures that were built prehistorically by humans that have some element of mystery to them. And today we're talking about the Pyramid of the Sun, the Pyramids of Giza, Stonehenge, Gobekli Tepe, and a series of mysterious ancient stone ruins recently found in South Africa. All of these monuments lie in very diverse places on the planet. There are a lot of other places I could have covered. I could have also gone. I could have gone into Angkor Wat in Cambodia. I could have gone into uh, Ethiopia. I could have gone into Brazil. There's so many different places that we could talk about, but uh, I, I picked a few that have some striking similarities to one another because I wanted to use that to keep the podcast particularly interesting. So. These, all of these sites date back to very various periods uh, of ancient human history. And, and what we're going to examine are the surprising commonalities that, that each of these locations shares. But first, let's describe all of these places from the supposedly most recently built to the oldest. Which I'm going to be honest here, it, it really might change the way that you see human civilization altogether when we wrap it up. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I'm not, I'm not even kidding. I'm really excited about this one. So the reason that I'm doing an episode on, about these particular subjects is to remind us all that our understanding of our history as human beings is constantly being challenged. Seems that the moment we've all figured it out, some archaeological find is unearthed that throws a wrench in, in, in our understanding of our race and our species and our history. And that's what each of the, disco the discoveries that I'm covering in the next half hour or so has done to jeopardize the validity of the very history books that we accept as fact. We're going to be doing a lot of time traveling today, so let's get right into it. Let's first take a jump to central Mexico in an area called Teotihuacan. And once we're there, we're making our first time jump of the day. All right, ready? Three, two... <laughs> All right, here we are. It is the year 200 Common Era, and we are in the heart of an empire that has no name. But we're standing in front of this huge megastructure that is currently being constructed. The name, the Pyramid of the Sun, was originally coined by the Aztec people in the 14th century when they discovered the ruins of the city. But the structure that the name was given to is far older than the Aztec Empire. The people who inhabited the land in which the pyramid sits back in the 3rd century are simply referred to as the Teotihuacan people, and their origins are uncertain to say the least. At first, it's believed that the Teotihuacan people were a collective of tribes and farmers who eventually gravitated together in the Teotihuacan Valley to begin establishing one of America's first cities, between 200 BC and 1 BC. But as the city was established, new economic enterprises were established, and urbanization gave way to organized housing and infrastructure, causing the city to thrive. And for the next 300 years, the population of the city exploded as word spread throughout Central America of a great metropolis, something that the people were unfamiliar with. Villagers from settlements with rarely more than 1,000 people were amazed to hear tales of a great city boasting tens of thousands of inhabitants, so they would go visit the city for themselves, having these stories proven to be true on arrival. 
As the civilization neared its zenith between 350 CE and 650 CE, the city planners began construction on two great architectural wonders of the city that last to this day, the Pyramids of the Sun and Moon. The ancient city of Teotihuacan, which many ruins of exist today, could be a topic in and of itself that could take up a lot of podcast episodes, but for the sake of the structure of this particular episode, I'm going to be focusing primarily on the Pyramid of the Sun, which was the centerpiece of the Teotihuacan metropolis. The Pyramid of the Sun was a religious monument built by the Teotihuacan people, though due to destruction done by looters and conquerors and the natural elements, no specific deity has ever really been associated with the temple itself. All we know about this specific temple is that it was built around the year 200 CE and continued to be improved upon for hundreds of years after. And to give you a basic idea of what this temple looks like, the base of the pyramid is made up of four even sides, each over about 700 feet long. That's more than two American football fields long on each side. And height-wise, the structure reaches to 233 and a half feet high. To think of that, imagine three semi-trucks with 53-foot trailers stacked on top of one another, facing upward. And that's about how tall the pyramid is. The base is huge, but the height doesn't exactly measure up. Don't envision the pyramids of Giza, because this is different. But that's by design. The Pyramid of the Sun has a series of three terraces from the base of the structure to the top, and so it's not a smooth ride from the bottom to the pyramid, from the bottom of the pyramid to the top. This is why it has a less grandiose slope than the Pyramids of Giza, though it is just as foreboding of a structure. So, why was this pyramid built? Well, the short answer is that we, we don't know. Our best predictions are that it was meant to be used to worship some sort of deity as a single statue of a god worshipped by several other Mesoamerican civilizations has been discovered within the pyramid, but that's about it. What we have learned from the pyramid is that the people who built it had a knowledge and understanding of astronomy as the pyramid is positioned to line up with certain celestial events happening on certain days of the year. For example, the western face of the pyramid lines up perfectly with the setting sun on August 11th and April 29th. And these dates are significant because it has been discovered that the Teotihuacan people followed a ritual calendar that outlined a 260-day period of rituals. And exactly 260 days exist between August 11th and April 29th. There are a lot of other discoveries found within the ruins of Teotihuacan, but for the episode's sake... We're going to tie the Pyramid of the Sun in with a few other pyramids that you may have heard of. Now, why am I including this pyramid in this episode? Well, there are a few shared similarities between it and the rest of the ancient monuments I will be covering, so keep this fact in mind. Carbon Dating estimates that the city of Teotihuacan was abandoned around 750 CE the Aztec civilization returned to repopulate the ruins of Teotihuacan in the 1300s, but found only a series of enormous ancient monuments and no one using them. What happened to the Teotihuacan people? How could a thriving civilization like this disappear completely? Archaeological studies show that it was a result of internal strife, and there is evidence to support the claim that some sort of uprising took place to bring down a ruling class. But once the uprising had ended, it seems that they all just disappeared for over 500 years. The city had reached over 100,000 inhabitants at its zenith. Where did they all go? The Pyramid of the Sun is part of a larger complex of structures, including the Pyramid of the Moon and the Temple of Quetzalcoatl. Together, the layout of these structures draws a rough parallel to the way the stars in Orion's belt are positioned. You know what else draws a rough parallel to the way the stars in Orion's belt are positioned? You may have guessed it. The Pyramids of Giza. If you get the chance, look up the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramids of Giza on Google Earth, and compare how the Pyramid of the Moon, the Pyramid of the Sun, and the Temple of Quetzalcoatl are positioned, juxtaposed with the layout of the Pyramids of Giza. It's not identical, 
but it is strikingly similar. And the kicker is that the base area of the Pyramid of the Moon is almost exact with the base area of the largest pyramid of the Giza necropolis, the Pyramid of Khufu. The pyramids of the sun and moon and the temple of Quetzalcoatl were built between 250 CE and 350 CE, right? Well, if we're going to look at the pyramids of Egypt, we've got to make another time jump. Hang on, boys and girls, it's about to get bumpy. We are heading to Egypt in... 2600 BCE. That's almost 3,000 years before the construction of the pyramid complex in Teotihuacan, and yet there are very striking similarities between the two. Fortunately, we have a bit more documentation of the civilization that built the pyramids of Giza. We know that the pyramids took 10 to 20 years to build. We know they were completed in the year 2560 BCE. We have documentation that the pyramids were built in the 4th Egyptian dynasty, which lasted between 2613 BCE, 2494 BCE, under the rule of Pharaoh Khufu, hence the name Pyramid of Khufu. And there is also a general consensus among Egyptologists that the largest and oldest pyramid was built as a tomb for that same pharaoh. And we know what eventually became of the Egyptian Empire, which fell several times to the Persians, the Greeks, and eventually to the Romans. But with how much we know, there's something that is very hard to explain in both of these sites. How were they built? We long accepted that human technological development is linear and only ever moving upward, but what if we're wrong? What if ancient people had technology far beyond what we can now understand that they have, or that they had? Many historians agreed for a long time that the ancient Egyptians enslaved whole societies and used them as a workforce, but that's now being challenged with newfound evidence that there were no slaves, and instead, huge amounts of workers, numbering in the hundreds of thousands used to construct the pyramids. And to add to this, our understanding of ancient technologies is that the wheel wasn't really introduced to Egypt until 1600 BCE. And the stone blocks used in the construction of the pyramids of Giza weighed, on average, 2.5 tons per block, and were transported over 500 miles, 934 kilometers, give or take, to the job site. That is 2.3 million blocks at 2.5 tons per block for three different pyramids. And we're expected to believe that they just drag them there? 500 miles? But that raises more questions. How did Pharaoh convince his people to do this kind of impossible work to build his tomb? Was he viewed as some sort of celestial being? How did he pay his workforce? If there were truly hundreds of thousands of workers, how big was this civilization? Surely there had to be enough food being grown to support such a force, and how many farmers would there need to be to feed them? I mean, this was 2500 BC, after all. There were only an estimated 15 million people on the entire planet at the time, and with a project of that magnitude being undertaken, such an empire could control potentially... 10% of the world's population. Was that possible at the time? Or is what we know about history flawed? How did two civilizations, thousands of years apart, take such an interest in the same constellation of stars, build the same type of impossibly huge structure in a manner that defies modern understanding of ancient societies with similar dimensions in some sort of celestial celebration. Interesting to think about. All right, we're going to briefly close the chapters on these pyramids and open a new chapter containing two strange archaeological finds that, like the pyramids, have some similarities to each other. One was buried for thousands of years beneath Turkish soil, and the other has been standing proudly in England next to the small town of Larkhill. We're talking about Gobekli Tepe and Stonehenge. You know what Stonehenge is. You see it in movies. You see it in pop-up books. It's on murals. It's in poetry. It's in conspiracy theories. Everybody knows what Stonehenge is, but very few people know what Gobekli Tepe is. And it's just as mysterious as Stonehenge, if not more so. First, let's discuss Stonehenge. Stonehenge is a prehistoric monument located in Wiltshire, Wiltshire, Shire, Wiltshire, I'm not sure, uh, that place, England, consisting of a ring of standing stones, each measuring 13 feet high and 7 feet wide, weighing in at around 25 tons each. 
Stonehenge is part of a larger complex of earthworks and burial mounds located in the same vicinity and was built in a series of phases lasting potentially thousands of years. We've got to jump in our time machine again, folks. We're... Here we go. Three... Two... Here we are, 3000 BCE, in lovely prehistoric England, and if we look around, we find ourselves standing in the middle of a shallow but expansive ditch, about 360 feet in diameter. This ditch has already been here for about 100 years, but and because of bones of animals that were found beneath the site, it was originally thought to have been a site of ritual sacrifice. But this is where the Stonehenge mystery begins, and where Tanner starts asking questions. The bones brought to Stonehenge were of many different animals, but the ages of these animals go beyond the original digging of this pit, and their DNA can be tracked to different areas of England. It's now thought that the people who participated in this first phase of Stonehenge had held on to the bones of these animals for some time, even through generations, before burying them beneath this pit. Why would traveling hunter-gatherers keep close a series of bones from different animals during their travels? Prior to the establishment of the Stonehenge complex, there were very few permanent settlements on the British Isles, and all were very small in population, giving credence to the idea that the people who began construction on Stonehenge were a nomadic people before beginning the first phase of Stonehenge. Why would a group of nomadic people be holding on to a bunch of bones from different animals? Why would they create one of the oldest supposedly religious sites in the world to bury them? Were they pets? Were the animals sacred to them? We don't know, and chances are, we'll never know. But to deepen this mystery, there were a series of human bones found beneath the area around Stonehenge as well, but DNA evidence suggests that these bones were from people who were not originally from the area near Stonehenge. They were from Wales, hundreds of miles away. These bones were also found to have been cremated, which suggests further kinds of ritualistic funerary practices. And for the next 500 years, Stonehenge remained little more than a series of burial pits and earthworks, still used by the same society who established it in 3100 BCE. But in 2600 BCE, 500 years later, something changed, and the people established a deeper religious and even scientific presence in the area. It's widely believed that around this time, Stonehenge starts to resemble the monument that we're familiar with. Two arrays of concentric holes were positioned within the first great pit we've previously discussed, laying the groundwork for one of the earliest evidences of stone structures at the site of Stonehenge. Eighty standing stones positioned symmetrically and placed in the concentric holes used as sockets in the earth for the great stones. Now hold on, these are not the huge pillars we associate with Stonehenge today, but rather a series of smaller features that can no longer really be seen directly at the site due to weathering and age. Evidence points to the claim that most of these stones were quarried from a quarry in Wales, around 150 miles away. Which is curious, as I already mentioned, how many of the bodies found buried beneath Stonehenge are also believed to have been from the same area in Wales. So what is special about the site of Stonehenge? Why travel so far to create it? The next phase of Stonehenge took place between the years 3600, uh, 2600 BC and 2400 BC. We don't have an exact... We haven't been able to narrow it down quite, quite, that, quite that closely. But this is where Stonehenge takes on the shape that we are most familiar with. 60 enormous stone blocks weighing 25 tons each were transported to the site from a quarry likely around 25 miles away and fashioned with special grooves to make the stones fit together and stay standing. Half were arranged in a circle measuring over 100 feet in diameter and the rest were placed atop those stones creating the iconic ring that we're so familiar with. Inside of this ring was a further set of stones, larger than the ones in the ring outside, weighing 50 tons each and creating a horseshoe shape within the structure. In these stones, carvings of daggers and axes can be found, while for the next millennia, smaller stones were periodically rearranged, 
This is the Stonehenge that would continue to exist until the last construction on the site around 1600 BCE. And since then, civilization who originally constructed Stonehenge has been lost to history. But there are so many questions left unanswered. There is scarcely any evidence of any lasting civilization around Stonehenge during the time of its construction. All permanent civilizations were in other parts of Britain at the time, usually near the coastline, but Stonehenge is miles and miles from any coast. Why was it built here, so far away from the nearest villages? What did it mean? There's plenty of proof that it was used to measure celestial events, but how is the structure itself constructed? How did these supposedly primitive people move stones weighing in excess of 25 tons, miles and miles, without wheels? This was 500 years before the construction of the pyramids, and they were moving stones that weighed 10 times as much as the average block used in the pyramids. How? Why? To deepen the mystery, there is evidence to support the idea that instead of permanent settlements, the areas around Stonehenge were the sites of a series of festivals that took place twice a year during the winter and summer solstices. That means that there were organized gatherings of people traveling from various areas around the island to unite at Stonehenge to celebrate either a religious or cultural ceremony. This is supported by studies that show there being a unification among prehistoric British people in the 2nd and 3rd millennia BCE. So I ask again, what was it about the site of Stonehenge, so far away from where the materials for the monument were constructed, and peculiarly distant from the nearest settlements, that drew people from far and wide to celebrate there twice a year? No matter how deeply historians and archaeologists dive, there are some questions that will probably never be answered because the people who built Stonehenge left no trace of any written language to decipher their intentions. They vanished. And whatever happened to these people may never be known. While Stonehenge bears similarities in its, in its function to the pyramids of Teotihuacan in Egypt, it bears similarities in its origin story with a lesser-known archaeological site that predates it by over 5,000 years. And Stonehenge already goes back to 3,000 BCE, remember? Beneath the sands of southeastern Turkey lies one of the most striking and surprising archaeological discoveries of all time. It's a series of circular pits, each with a collection of pillars surrounding one large monolith, Discovered entirely by accident by a farmer in the 1960s, though excavation didn't begin until the 1990s. So, what is it? Well, in its current state of excavation, Gobekli Tepe is a series of 20 circular pits, each with one large T-shaped monolith and some surrounding pillars. And on these T-shaped structures, each measuring upward of 15 feet, are carvings of animals, bulls, foxes, cranes, lions, insects, arachnids, gazelles, donkeys, even human beings. These pillars are positioned in specially made sockets dug into the bedrock, and many of the pillars weigh more than 10 tons. The floors of the pits are mostly made of polished limestone, meaning it was intentionally crafted to look pleasing to the eye. Some historians have labeled Gobekli Tepe as the world's first cathedral on a hill, as the pits are perched, indeed, on a hill. And it's fairly obvious that the site was used as some sort of religious gathering place from generation to generation. But how old are these pits? Well, there are a few answers for this. Gobekli Tepe is intriguing and similar to Stonehenge for several reasons. First, there is absolutely no evidence that there was any sort of permanent settlement in this area. So, like Stonehenge, the people who built Gobekli Tepe migrated to the area, built the monument, used it exclusively for some sort of ritual or series of rituals, and then bailed and headed back to wherever they came from. Also like Stonehenge, it's been found that Gobekli Tepe was built in a series of phases, hinting that the site was visited and celebrated by either the same or similar societies through a period lasting several thousand years. 
and that feasts and festivals would be held in this area occasionally without anyone ever sticking around permanently. This is why it's difficult to gauge exactly how old it is. But the most recent phase, and most recent construction, dates back to, get this, 8,000 BCE. 5,000 years before Stonehenge, 5,500 years before the Pyramids of Giza, and over 8,000 years before the Pyramid of the Sun. But the oldest sections of Gobekli Tepe? Potentially 10,000 BCE. 10,000 BCE. That is pre-Neolithic Revolution. And then, the people who built Gobekli Tepe disappeared. Though they didn't technically abandon the site. How did Gobekli Tepe stay hidden for so long? Well, archaeologists have come to a single conclusion. The site was deliberately buried by the people who built it. The winds in eastern Turkey aren't strong enough to layer as much dust and dirt as would be needed to cover Gobekli Tepe entirely, and with the state the monuments are in, there's very little wind erosion to be found on the structures. Whoever was using Gobekli Tepe decided to cover it up. And that's to their credit, because it has been so well preserved. Why did they do it? We can't know for certain. At some point, the site had served its purpose, and the reasoning behind its creation was no longer relevant to the situation of those who used the site. So there was some consensus among the people that, instead of abandoning the site, they wanted to cover it up entirely. But the question remains, why? Abandoning a monument is easy. You just leave it and move on. If it's not that important to you anymore, there's no need to try to preserve it, but for whatever reason, the people who built Gobekli Tepe thought it necessary to completely bury their creation in a manner so efficient that it stayed buried for 10,000 years before they moved on. This also lends credence to the idea that it's unlikely they were rapidly driven out of the land. The site is so expansive that it would have taken years to cover with dirt particularly with the primitive tools the prehistoric humans carried. This was a systematic burying of the world's first cathedral on a hill. Last thing about Gobekli Tepe before we move on to the last and most insane location on this list. Many of the monoliths used at the site weighed 10 tons or more. The people at the Pyramid of the Sun could move crazy amounts of weight. The ancient Egypts could do the same, and the ones who built Stonehenge found a way to do it too. And now the masterminds behind Gobekli Tepe are, adding, are added to the list of primitive engineers. But how did they all do it? With weights that we can only move using modern machinery today, the builders of these monuments used with pure human strength and primitive engineering systems. How? We don't know. We may never know. There's a lot we may never know. And before I leave you today, there's one more site that I saved for the very last. We know hardly anything about it. We haven't even named it. But discovered in the last 10 years in southeastern Africa is a sprawling metropolis of huge stone circles and small walls hidden deep in the rural landscape. The ruins are so old and eroded that they can only be seen properly from the air, and it's then that their wonder is revealed. There are roads, there are walls, full layouts of ancient structures, temples, and administrative buildings, and it's all made of a mineral called dolerite. Now, that's, it's important to know that it's made of dolerite because that's how we measure how old this place is. There are only a few scientists willing to venture so far to examine these ruins, but the few who have did a few studies on dolerite and its erosion patterns. They compared the climate of the land that the ruins were found in to, similar, to dolerite in similar climates that have been carbon dated, and they were shocked at what they found. And the many samples of dolerite they took from the ruins in South Africa all pointed to the same time period. These stones were placed in that location around 200,000 years ago. 200,000 years ago. Now hang on, before you throw that to the side, 
because it sounds a little bit implausible, here's a few things to think about. Artifacts found at the site have given the, the scientists the idea that the civilization who inhabited the ruins was way more advanced than we could possibly understand. Not necessarily more advanced than us, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying way more advanced than our understanding of primitive humans. There are claims that they used sound and frequencies as a method for healing the sick, and that they had developed a calendar. We have a fundamental understanding of our existence as human beings. We were born in the cradle of civilization in Ethiopia, migrated to the Fertile Crescent in Iraq and Iran, began the Neolithic Revolution, and started society. That's what we're taught in history class. What if we're wrong? What if it's all wrong? We were wrong about the earth being flat. We were wrong about being the earth being the center of the universe. We were wrong about the sun being the center of the universe. And then every single one of these archaeological discoveries has caused us to ask more questions about our origins as a species. We have not always been as primitive as we previously believed. So what if there really was a civilization that existed 200,000 years ago in southern Africa, more advanced and more organized than we could ever have imagined? Two last things, then we'll wrap this bad boy up. Good episode. First, the oldest known civilization is the civilization of Sumer and the ancient Sumerians back in 4500 BCE. The ancient Sumerians kept a calendar of kings that dated back 250,000 years, though the lengths of the reigns of those kings can be disputed, as they are impractical, some lasting over thousands of years at a time. However, that same calendar has specific dates and names and could lend credence to the idea that human society is much older than we know. Second, at the site of this ancient South African city, there has been found a hieroglyph of an Ankh, an ancient Egyptian symbol for life. You know what an Ankh looks like. It's a cross with a rounded top. By itself, this could be passed off as a coincidence, but what I found next struck a chord with me and really made me wonder, which I love to do. Discovered among these ancient ruins is a megalithic calendar similar to Stonehenge, meaning these people had their own system of keeping dates. When examined, do you know what this calendar aligns with on certain days? The constellation Orion. And that is how I'm going to end this episode. Maybe I'm wrong about some things I talked about. Maybe the dates of these things are incorrect. Maybe we've totally gotten all of that wrong, and really what we understand about human society today is correct. That's totally plausible. But what if it's not? What if there's more to our story as a human species than we know right now? What if? I like to think about it. All right. Thanks for joining me today on Tanner Talks About Stuff That Happened. I have recently set up a studio uh, in my house, and I'm still getting used to it. Um, I haven't used headphones before. This is the first episode, actually, that I've used headphones in, so the volume might be a little bit different, a little bit skewed. I'm not used to it. I'm still learning how to do it, but... Thank you for joining me this far. This is pro this was this was a really fun episode. I'll be totally honest about that. This was the, one of the most fun I've had in researching episodes up to this point, and I it's it's only going to be up from here. There's only going to be more fun episodes. I'm starting to learn how to make information more interesting, how to connect events more thoroughly, and um, I'm starting to learn how to do this. So. If you've been with me from the beginning, you're awesome. Thank you for being here. Uh, if you haven't left a review on uh, Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts, go ahead and run over there. Leave a five-star review if you enjoy the podcast. It really does help us get more people involved with the conversations about history and maybe things that we're wrong about. Something to think about. All right. I will catch you next week. Thanks for joining me on Tanner Talks About Stuff That Happened. I am over and out. Catch you later.